second half of the chapter 10 in John, starting at verse 22, and, and finishing out chapter 22, excuse me, chapter 10 this week, 22 to 42, and then next week get into John chapter 11. And this week is kind of the second half of Jesus' I am the Good Shepherd discourse, the seventh of the seven discourses that are in the section of John, sometimes referred to as the, the Book of Signs. And in chapter 11, we'll see the seventh sign as we're getting closer to that section and then move to the end of that section and then moving into the next section, the third section of the book, the Book of Glory. Um, also with the Book of Signs, this in the Gospel of John is primarily wrapping up his public ministry prior to going to the cross and the resurrection. The next section that we'll move, be moving into in a few weeks, the Book of Glory, focuses more on Jesus' teaching with his disciples and then, of course, the trial, crucifixion, and resurrection of Christ. So let's open with prayer. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us so we can come together to look into your word and see what you have for us. Um, pray that you will bless it to us and pray for the, the morning service and also those working with the kids down the hall and the teens down the hall that you bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So this would be where we were with the Feast of the Tabernacles would have been the Feast of the Tabernacles that would have occurred before the final Passover. So this is within the last six to nine months time period uh, because let's see, the Feast of Tabernacles would have been towards the end of October and then the next Passover in the next you know, March, April would have been the triumphal entry and uh, crucifixion. So this would be towards the end because at this point, the second half of this we're going to see in chapter 10 is set more in December time around the Feast of Dedication. So chapter 10, thematically both pieces work together with this theme of Jesus as a shepherd, Jesus as a door, and the believers as his sheep that we looked at last week in verses 1 to 21. And then the second half of that thematically builds on that. There's more references to Jesus being the shepherd and the sheep, and there's an emphasis on the relationship between the Son and the Father, which is a theme that's been throughout the entire Gospel of John, starting with John 1.1. Even though they're thematically tied together, they are not one continuous conversation. The first part occurred right after the healing of the man born blind. It was very likely closer to the Feast of the Tabernacles end of October, early November for our months. Whereas this we're going to see is set in the Feast of Dedication, which for our months would be December, for the Jewish months would be Kislev. Skip that, that's from last week. So let's jump into verses 22 to 24. It's in the structure here. Verses 22 to 24 are John as the narrator stepping in and making an introduction to set the stage as far as when this is occurring, what was going on in Jerusalem at that time, and all of Israel and what Jesus was doing. This is an introduction that is kind of setting the stage for this part of the discourse. So in verse 22 of chapter 10, we have now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. 
So the setting here is it's during the Feast of Dedication. The Feast of Dedication has some differences with the other Jewish feasts that we've seen so far as far as the Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles and that this is a Jewish feast that does not show up in the Old Testament scriptures. Partially because the events that it's celebrating occurred kind of in that quiet time, that silent time between the end of the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament. So this is a, a feast that the Jews would celebrate that is not in the Old Testament scriptures, not that it's you know, a wrong feast or something like that. It's also sometimes called the Feast of Lights, and we would know it as Hanukkah. And so this is celebrating the rededication of the temple. In 167 BC, the Syrian leader Antiochus Epiphanes IV overran Jerusalem. Syria had already taken over much of Israel, but they had not overrun and taken over the temple. And Antiochus Epiphanes was actually sending an army against Egypt, but Egypt was too, too strong. And so kind of to save face, he's like, well, I need a big victory. Ah, Jerusalem, let's go after Jerusalem. That's a notable place. And they don't have much of an army. There's not a lot of people there. They're not Egypt. We can win this one. And they did, partially because at that time, there really wasn't a Jewish army. And so he set up a pagan altar in the temple completely desecrated the temple, sacrificed pigs on the temple altar, dedicated the altar to Zeus. He claimed to be a deity himself, and he made it a capital offense to possess the Hebrew scripture. And so this became his attempt to save face and get a victory because he couldn't have a victory over Egypt ended up being the catalyst for revolt as far as the Jews trying to take back the temple. And this was led by Judas Maccabees, known as the Hammer. And in 164 BC, he and his rebel forces that he had, he had uh, uh, brought together recaptured the temple, rededicated to God, and out of this came this celebration, this Feast of Dedication, Feast of Lights, Hanukkah, that would celebrate God raising up this deliverer, Judas and Maccabee, and also would celebrate other individuals that God rose up to deliver the Israelites. And would be an eight-day celebration and would have lighting of lights each, each night throughout that. And so there would be this, this symbol of light that figured prominently in this. And this would have been, in Kislev, our month of December, even though their winter would have been different than ours, their winter would be the rainy season. It still would be a cold, dark, rainy time. So having this this festival that's focused on God's provision, God enabling them to retake the temple, even though at that time they did not throw off seer and roll com rule completely, they did take back the temple. And so it, was this, it is this joyous feast, similar to the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of Tabernacles commemorating God bringing them out of Israel, excuse me, out of Egypt to the promised land of Israel with Moses as the leader and building these tabernacles to, these temporary tabernacles to commemorate that and the symbolism of lights. And overall, these are both very joyous festivals. One big difference, though, is Feast of Tabernacles is a pilgrimage festival, and the Jewish men are expected to come to Jerusalem, to the temple for that. 
whereas the Feast of Dedication is a home festival where one stays in their home or their home village and celebrates this. So there wouldn't be this large migration of individuals to Jerusalem. The individuals who lived in Jerusalem would be celebrating it there in Jerusalem. But those who lived in Galilee would be celebrating it in Galilee. So this also marked at that time, the, really the first time a Jewish army had been raised up since the Babylonian captivity some 400 years prior to this. And it was very much, their success was very much based on basically guerrilla warfare tactics and ambushing the Syrians in ways that the Syrians were not ready for and, and didn't understand the tactics that were being brought to bear against them and uh, failed because of that. So that's the setting here. Jesus is, is walking in the Temple of Solomon's porch during the Feast of Dedication. Solomon's porch would be the most outermost portion of the temple. It was a partially enclosed part of the temple. Most of the other conversations we've had up to this point where we've seen Jesus talking in the temple would be an open courtyard area. This is a little bit more closed in in that the outer walls were closed in, the inner walls were supported by these columns, and so it was open into the temple mount area but there was protection from the winter rains and the winter winds. And so it would make sense that that's where he would be at that time because there was more shelter. The other reference to Solomon's porch would be one that isn't related directly to what was going on at this time, but would be something that those in the early church would pick up on and John likely would have included, because especially for he and Peter, this had an importance. It was an area that after the resurrection, the first believers went and proclaimed Christ in the temple area, specifically in Solomon's porch area. In both Acts 3 and Acts 5, there's references to this. In the interest of time, we're not going to turn there, but in Acts 3, the reason it would be important to John is as he's writing these, he's looking back, and both these events that occurred here with Jesus at the Feast of Dedication that he was an eyewitness to, he would have, would have been in the past, but also would have been an occurrence that's recorded in Acts 3 that he and Peter were involved with after the resurrection, in that they approach a man who's lame, and the man who's lame thinks that they're going to offer him money. And they say, no, we don't have silver and gold, but we offer you something better, and they heal him in the name of Christ. And of course, this gathers a crowd of onlookers, and then they proclaim to them that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and they proclaim Christ, that they are able to heal this man, not because of their godliness, but because of Christ. And that occurred in Solomon's porch. So that would be something that reading this, the, the first believers would be like, yeah, you know, those like, those who've gone to you know, the rescue myths here, or Jeff and Oneida, or and others who've gone to Oneida, that would be something that they'd be reading in the early church and be like, yeah, that's where we went and proclaimed Christ. Um, we're familiar with that spot. And that would be a link to their shepherd having delivered a message in that same physical location. That's something that those of us who've never been to Israel you know, kind of miss out on. You think about it, these were individuals in the early church who they were witnessing and proclaiming the gospel in the same place that Jesus Christ did, physically. That's something in the United States that we, we kind of miss out being part of the outermost part of the world, I guess. In Acts 5, Verse 12, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. 
And something significant about that is this event with Jesus at Solomon's porch is tied very strongly to him talking about he and his father are one, the shepherd and the sheep are one, the shepherd knows the sheep, and the sheep know the shepherd. There was an emphasis in last week's passage about a unity between the father and the son, and we'll see that again this week, and a unity between the shepherd and the sheep, knowing each other. And here we have, through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. They all had unity in this location that was the second half of Jesus' message on the unity of him with the Father and the unity of the shepherd and the sheep. And additionally, to authenticate their message, they were doing signs and wonders very similar to what we see in the Gospel of John as being authentication for Jesus. And Jesus, we're going to see, even talks about that in this passage as far as the works that he has done being authentication for the words that he says. And so there's this, this tie-in with the early church and this event that occurs here. In verse 24, we then have the Jews surround him. The term there, the Jews surround him, kind of gives a hostile connotation here. They didn't come to listen to him. They came to surround him and isolate him for the others. And here the Jews would be referring to the Jewish rulers again. In the Gospel of John, the Jews is used different ways in context. It sometimes refers to all Jewish people. It sometimes refers to just the Jews who live in Jerusalem and other times to the Jewish rulers. Here it's likely the Jewish rulers who say, hmm, the last time he left, they were picking up stones to stone him, I think. And here he's back. And so they surround him. So you kind of see a little bit of hostile event, which is kind of sad because in verse 23, Jesus is walking in the temple during the Feast of Dedication. The temple being this, the, that central location where God meets with the Jewish people and the Feast of Dedication being their celebration of people who God sent to save them such as Judas Maccabees. And here is the individual, the individual who's both man and God, who's greater than Judas Maccabees, who's greater than Moses, who's greater than Abraham, who's greater than anyone from the Old Testament. And the response is to surround him. And ask him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, Tell us plainly. Now, an initial reading of that, it might be like, oh, wait a minute. They're finally wanting to become disciples. They're finally wanting to be like, oh, you know, if you really are the Messiah, just proclaim it to us and we'll believe. But that doesn't really seem to be the context here. Different English translations translate the term, how long do you keep us in doubt, differently. Some say, how long do you keep us in suspense? Some even, how long do you are you going to annoy us? And all of those are legitimate from the Greek as far as legitimate connotations of what that keep us in doubt. How long are you keeping us in suspense? How long are you going to annoy us with this? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And we're going to see as we go through this that it's not because they want to believe. It's not because, like, well, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. We need to hear from himself directly. It's more going back to they want evidence to kill him. They're looking for a plain, cotton-dried statement that they can take to the Jewish people and say, he committed blasphemy. He's claiming to be someone he is not. He is claiming to be the Son of God. They want to see him say this plainly. 
which is why they've surrounded him and are demanding this from him. Their intent is to find evidence to attack Jesus further. And that becomes very clear from Jesus' response and their response to his response. So in verses 25 to 30, Jesus responds, and part of his response is that his works, the signs that he's done, testify to the truth of his words. And even though at this point and at no point does Jesus specifically and explicitly proclaim himself to be the Christ, to be the Messiah, publicly to the Jewish rulers. He did that with the Samaritan woman, but that wasn't publicly to the Jewish rulers. He had John the Baptist specifically saying that this is the Son of God. This is the Lamb of God who takes away sins. So he hasn't explicitly, but through everything that he said and everything that he's done, he has told them who he is and why he's there. And so his answer to them is, I told you. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. And the inference there is, he's saying, look, you've already been given, I've said enough, I've done enough. You're either going to believe or you're not going to believe. Me saying it again isn't. Kind of like when, when they kept asking the blind, the man who was born blind who had been healed, asking him, is Jesus a sinner? What happened? What is this? And he's like, I've already told you. Do you want to become disciples? Knowing that they don't. And when he tells them again more plainly and connects the dots to them that basically nobody has ever seen somebody born blind be healed. Blind people have been healed, but not somebody born blind. And in the Pharisees' own teaching, that was a miracle reserved for the Messiah. That was a messianic. And so when he connects the dots for them, rather than accepting that and believing that Jesus is the Messiah, they excommunicate him and kick him out of the synagogue. And then Jesus approaches him and confirms the man's suspicions that he is the Messiah. And Jesus goes on to explain, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So he goes on to explain to me, he's like, look, I I've told you. He says his works, healing a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years, healing a man who was born blind, his discussion on being the bread of life, all the other miracles that he did. And every time he did those, he emphasized he was not doing those in and of himself. He was doing those because he was sent from his father. He was sent by God, the God that they say that they were worshiping. And then he brings back the sheep analogy and tells them that he's done all these things and it's not really going to matter if he tells them again until they believe because his sheep hear his words and they are not hearing his words because once again, they are not his sheep. He's told them this before, he's repeating it again and saying, if you were my sheep, you would already know. Because you're not my sheep, you don't know. You are not the followers. Because we saw in the first part of this, the characteristic of the believer is that they hear Jesus' word, they follow and obey. And then the consequences of hearing, following, and obeying, Jesus repeats in verse 28. And I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And basically he's saying the same thing three times to really emphasize it. Give them eternal life, never perish. If one has eternal life, they will never perish. 
And the distinction between like dying and perishing is significant to the Jewish people. Perishing has a connotation of being eternal torment in Hades. Doesn't show up in the Gospel of John, but in the Sea of Galilee, when Jesus throws the demons out of the men into the pigs, and the pigs run into the Sea of Galilee, it says that they perish. That's usually not a term used to refer to animals. Animals die. The perish there isn't just that the pigs and the demons died in the Sea of Galilee. They perished. They were put into eternal damnation, eternally separated from God. The other picture there is the sea, the deep was seen as this terrifying place. It was often used as a, a metaphor for Hades or hell. And so the pigs perishing in the deep of the Sea of Galilee is more than that just they died. Yeah, that would be tied to the same, the same concept um, as far as he loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if anything, right here, Jesus is basically restating John 3.16 in this passage because he's saying those who are his sheep are his sheep because they hear, they believe, and they follow, and the consequences of that are he gives them eternal life, and they'll never perish. And in John 3, 16, those who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's stated in the opposite order in John 3, 16, but it's, it's the same thing, because this, where he says, I give them eternal life, is in reference to his sheep. In verse 26, he says that, those he's addressing, the Jewish rulers at that time, do not believe because they don't believe they are not his sheep. Because, and because they are not his sheep, they do not hear his voice, they do not follow. And because of that, they will perish because they are not safe in his hand. But something that's, that's kind of added here, it's not really added in verse 28, that doesn't quite show up in John 3.16, is this, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Jesus is saying here the reason his sheep, reason those who believe in him will have eternal life and will not perish is because of the power and authority that he has. And our security lies not in ourself or what we do, but our security relies in this promise that Jesus said, neither shall anyone snatch him out of his hand. That's why we have eternal life. That's why we we'll never perish. We'll die physically, but a believer, a Christian, will not perish. Yes. Because this is security that is a gift from the good shepherd because of, in verse 29, the authority has been given from the Father. My Father who has given them to me, again, the emphasis on given, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. God placed the church, the believers, in Jesus' hands, and they're also in God's hands. And this is also tied back to John 3.16, because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that those who believe should not perish, but have everlasting life. This here, through 26 to 29, is essentially a restatement of John 3.16. 
that Jesus is saying, those who hear his voice, those who believe are his sheep. Those who are sheep will be given eternal life, will never perish, because no one can snatch them out of their hand, because they've been given to him by the Father, who is greater than all, and no one can snatch anything out of his hand. And so here in this passage, it also kind of expands on the concept of John 3.16 to eternal security. That it's not about us earning or losing salvation. It's about believing and following the good shepherd who gives these things freely to his sheep. The security is not based on what we do. It's based on what Jesus has done through the Father. Verse 30. Um, <laughs> and so, and this is really a really important key statement in this passage. And even, you know, it, it is something that Jesus has referenced in previous discussions. But now he comes out very plainly and saying that this is consistent, this is correct, because in verse 30 he says, I and my Father are one. Nothing Jesus does is independent of the Father because he and the Father are one. They can't do things independent of each other. They are distinct, but they are also one. Both the work and identity of the Son and the Father can only be described as one. So anything that is in the Father's hand is in Jesus' hand. Anything that is in Jesus' hand is in the Father's hand. And here is the other thing that's remarkable here. These individuals have surrounded him with hostility. These individuals are the same individuals that back in chapter 5 plotted to kill him. In chapter 7 took up stones to stone him. In chapter 8, I think I have that verse here. There we go. Chapter 8, verses 58 and 59, when Jesus says to them, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, they take up stones to throw at him. He had already told them who he was, and the response was to pick up stones. Here, he says, he comes out in very similar statement, I and my father are one, and what's the response? Uh, let's see, where am I here? There we go. They take up stones to stone him, which their actions tip their hand and makes it very clear in verse 24 when they ask him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. They are not requesting he do this because they want to believe. They are not doing this out of innocent curiosity. They are doing this because they are looking for another opportunity to do what they failed to do already, is pick up stones and stone him. And I also should have mentioned in chapter 7, they send the temple police to arrest him. And in each of those times, Jesus removes himself. Or in the case of the temple guards who come to arrest him, they realize that Jesus is saying words that no man has said. They back off, go back to the Jewish rulers and like, we're not arresting him. Um, they don't necessarily believe but they at least recognize that they did not have the authority that Jesus had. What's also remarkable in this is despite the fact that they've surrounded him, despite the fact they have hostile intent, his response is basically John 3, 16, and repeat the gospel to them and offer them life if they were to hear him, believe him, follow him, and become his sheep. 
and that he would give them eternal life that they should never perish and be secure in his hands. So even when faced with this, and we're going to see as this proceeds on, that that continues to be his message. Because something happens a little different here. In verse 31, we have the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Now first, stoning as a judicial act should have been preceded by an actual judicial trial and sentencing rather than a mob just picking up stones and deciding, oh, we're going to stone you. The problem with that was in this time period, they're under Roman rule, capital punishment is the authority of Rome, Rome like crucifixion. The Jews wanted to stone Jesus for blasphemy under Old Testament law, and so they had to resort to a mob stoning. No court proceedings, because if court proceedings proceeded, they would get in trouble with Rome. Now, they might still get in trouble with Rome for stoning somebody, but on the other hand, if they're able to keep it quiet because they did it in the temple and there's no Romans looking around and there's no evidence, they may be thinking they can get away with this. The other thing here is that in each of those other times, verse five, chapter 5, 7, and 8, where the Jewish rulers plot to kill him, send guards to arrest him, to kill him, and pick up stones to stone him in chapter 8. Each one of those, Jesus immediately removed himself because his time to be killed had not come yet. Here, he doesn't remove himself yet. He continues the conversation. In verse 32, he answers them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father, for which of these works do you stone me? Now he's not asking this because he needs to know. He's asking this to get them and any onlookers to stop and think. He's reinforcing them. And in the Greek, good works, ergakala, could be, have the connotation of noble works or beautiful works. So he's saying many good, noble, beautiful works I have shown you from my father. He has shown them a man born blind receiving sight. A man paralyzed receiving the ability to walk and many other miracles. He's saying, which of these do you stone me for? Because he wants them to stop and think about a religious institution that's gotten to the point that they see somebody healing a blind man and somebody healing a paralytic as being a capital offense. That somehow things have gotten twisted. He's also pointing out here that the works that he has done are not only good, noble, and beautiful works, but these works are in the power and authority of God himself. He's not doing them in and of himself. It's a father. And so he's also asking them, this God that you say you believe in, this God that you are picking up stones to protect against blasphemy, he's the one who gave Jesus his power. So he's wanting them to stop and re-examine so that they might start hearing his words and believe and have eternal life. He's not come, as in... John 3.16 is followed by 3.17 that Jesus didn't come to condemn. Here, he's trying to, he's judging them, but he's holding off on condemnation to give them an opportunity to believe. And that is something that really emphasizes in this passage the patience and mercy of God that even faced with people who are completely rebellious he continually gives opportunity on opportunity in order to respond. And so verse 33, the Jews' response is, for good work we do not stone you. It's like, of course not. We don't stone people for good works. That would be silly. But for blasphemy and because you, being a man, make yourself God. They recognize that he is saying that he is God, 
and they reject it. And by rejecting it, as Jesus has pointed out, they're also rejecting that God is God because Jesus and his Father are one. You reject one, you reject both. And that's something, going back to to Jeff's comment, that's something that a lot of false religions, they will recognize Jesus as being a good moral man, a prophet, but will reject him while at the same time saying they worship God. Here, the Gospel of John says you can't do that. And not only that, it's kind of foolishness to look at the Bible and the Gospel of John and just paint Jesus as a good moral man. Because there's a problem with that. If he's a good moral man who said that he was God, he's a liar. That's not a good moral man. If, on the other hand, he wasn't lying when he said that, and he wasn't, then he's not just a good moral man. He is God, who he claimed to be. And so they say, for good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy and because you being a man make yourself God. Now at least their logic is consistent because they're saying the punishment for blasphemy in the Old Testament is stoning. Since you're blasphemy, we should stone you. That's actually a more logical, consistent argument than saying God is a, excuse me, Jesus is a good moral man because the evidence doesn't even support that. But the problem is they're ignoring the good works he's doing as authentication and sign that his word is correct. And so Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the son of God. Here, Jesus is making a reference to Psalm 82. I was going to turn there, but because we are running low on time, I'm just going to mention one verse out of there, if I can find it. Psalm 82. Well, no, I'm going to read it quickly. Psalm 82. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy, free from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. This could have been written about these Pharisees here. Now here in this, God is speaking in this psalm, and he refers to a group of humans as, in verse 6, you are gods, and all of you are children the Most High. Now, God is not saying here that there's a pantheon of gods. He's rather referring to a group of people who've been given the authority from God and power from God. In in the Near East, in ancient times, if a messenger was sent from a king with a message, as long as that messenger did not go off script, Anything that messenger said was taken as the word of the king. And that messenger was to be treated as if the messenger was the king, even though the messenger wasn't the king. Because the messenger was sent by the king, the messenger was given authority and power from that king, and to kill that messenger was more than just an act against a messenger, it was an act against the king himself, because it was understood that at that time, that messenger was fully representing the king, was speaking the words of the king, and doing the king's business. So here it's likely you are gods 
is a similar reference. Now, one of the commentaries I looked at thinks that this psalm is a reference to the judges that God gave power and authority to act and bring judgment on God's behalf. Others think it was the nation of Israel as a whole at the time that they were given the law through Moses, that they became uh, able to judge with the power and authority of God through this law that they'd be given. Either way, though, in this psalm, God is condemning these individuals because they've abandoned what they were supposed to do. They judge unjustly. They showed partiality to the wicked. They did not defend the poor and the fatherless that they were supposed to. They did not deliver the poor and the needy. And it ends with them being condemned to die and sort of a prophecy in verse 8 of chapter 82, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. So here Jesus is coming as that judge who's replacing them. And what Jesus' argument here is, in verse 34, he's saying, Is it not written in your law? He's saying to them, they're picking up stones because they're saying he's committed blasphemy because he says he's the son of God. He points out a passage in Psalm where God himself referred to certain people, whether it's all of Israel or subset, as being gods, and that wasn't blasphemy. And he's saying, so he who's sent by the Father has done good works, has claimed to be the Son of God, is not committing blasphemy. Because the lesser, and here he's using an argument, a lesser to greater. And this argument was used in chapter 7, where Jesus was, again, by the same group of people, being confronted for healing a paralytic man on the Sabbath. He broke the Sabbath, they said, because under the Pharisaic laws, you weren't supposed to heal on the Sabbath. He points out to them that if a child is born, a son is born, and it lands on the Sabbath for the day of circumcision, that they go ahead and circumcise because circumcision in that case takes precedence over the Sabbath. So it's not breaking the Sabbath. And he's saying that's a lesser rule. He healing a man and making him whole on the Sabbath would be even greater than fulfilling circumcision. And so if they accept the lesser, they have to accept the greater. Here they're saying if they accept the scripture, the law in Psalm 82, where God uses this phrasing, why on earth are they looking to stone him? That they shouldn't. They're not following the law correctly. And he uses as evidence the works he has done of his father. So verse 37 will pick up, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. The Old Testament judges, their office, their authority, their power is rooted in God and so is his. And the evidences of that are the works that God has enabled him to do. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So he repeats the oneness of he and the Father. He also repeats, even after they've picked up stones to kill him, he's, asked, he's calling them to believe and have eternal life. There's a mob of people who want to kill him, and his response is to offer them hope and salvation. And their response in verse 39 they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. So this time he stays around. He offers them further evidence based on logic from the, the law. Offers them again the hope of salvation and belief in him. And again they reject. And this time he walks away. And then this ends with him leaving Jerusalem. He went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. There he stayed. 
Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And many believed him in there. So he leaves those who don't believe him in Jerusalem. He leaves Jerusalem, goes to where John the Baptist had been preaching. John the Baptist is dead at this point, And many believe him there. This in the Gospel of John is the last that Jesus will go to Jerusalem until the triumphal entry and his crucifixion. He's walked away from them. He's offered them. They've rejected, they've rejected, they've rejected, and so he walks away. What's also noticeable here in the book of John, Jesus' public ministry is kind of bookended. It starts with John the Baptist proclaiming him as he sees him to go by, to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And John, the evangelist, is one of those who believes and becomes a disciple of Christ. And then here we have Jesus returning to that geographical location that John the Baptist pointed out Jesus to John the evangelist, John the disciple, and many others believe. And in between, we have what we've been covering. This also, this reference to John the Baptist would have been significant to John, the narrator here, because he initially was a disciple of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, with his words, pointed him to Jesus. He heard and he followed and became one of the sheep. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words and we pray that we would listen to your word, we'd hear your word, and we'd follow your word. In Jesus' name.